guide us through this thing. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, normally I would say uh, good morning and welcome to Trinity. Welcome to this day that the Lord hath made and say that we will rejoice and be glad in it. Well, we certainly will rejoice and be glad in it, but right now for this week and uh, for next week, you will not be able to be here with us. And so uh, we wanted to make sure the, the leadership of the church got together and we wanted to make sure that you still had access to the word um, to the preaching, to the thought, uh, because when we're in crisis, uh, the, the best thing we can possibly do is to draw closer to God. Now, according to the governor and so forth, drawing close to one another is not a good thing to do right now. And so we're going to kind of take it uh, a week at a time and make the decisions as we go. Uh, we obviously want to honor uh, what the government is calling us to do and uh, and uh, if we need to close down for a bit, we will. But again, we will take it a little bit at a time. This thing seems to be uh, evolving and opening up on a daily basis. And so we don't know exactly what tomorrow is going to bring. But uh, according to God, we don't need to know. And so I'll be doing my, my messages uh, and the Sundays, not the Sunday school, but the adult Bible study lessons and uh, probably some announcements and so forth um, on video from time to time. And so just kind of uh, stay tuned and we'll go from there. First and foremost, let's come to him in prayer. Father, oh my goodness, Father, things have changed uh, and uh, we don't like what's going on in the world around us. And we look for this thing called peace. But you tell us that peace can only come through you. And so, Father, we turn to you. It doesn't matter where we are. We can be together or we can be separate. You are always with us. Your Holy Spirit will guide us, will protect us. And we thank you for that. And so as we go, Lord, we just ask that you keep our faith strong and that you keep us in the Word and, and that we think of new ways to reach out to one another. Uh, Oh, there's all sorts of technology we can use, Lord. Let us use it to glorify you. And we say this, of course, in Jesus' name. Amen. The verse that I was, verses that I was going to preach for today are coming uh, Romans, as you know, for Lent. We're doing a study um, in the book of Romans. This morning is Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. But if you're home uh, and you've got the opportunity, open your Bibles and... Uh, for the next several weeks, we're going to be in Romans, and so uh, a reread of Romans wouldn't be a, a bad thing. Paul says this, and, and the, the paragraph starts out saying, "What you know, peace and joy, what is that? He says, therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through this life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. And so, Paul is talking about the strength that is to come, from our relationship with God. And he also talks about the idea that when we get 
caught up in the things of the world uh, and our, our schedules are changed and we don't seem to have much control over what's going on, then all of a sudden we feel like our faith is weak. But Paul says that we need to understand that, that these things happen so that our faith might be bolstered. And that's the theme for today. Good times and bad times all come together in Christ to develop our Christian character. Have you assessed your character lately? How about your Christian character? And so what is God trying to teach us right now? You remember, there's no such thing as coincidence. God introduces things into our lives at a certain time for a certain reason, and it's up to us to figure it out. So, where's your happy place? Is it of this world? The term reflects a desire for an ideal world, a quiet place to think, a place to be alone, or maybe be with people that you can really trust and, and open up to your, your innermost feelings and discuss with them. Who among us can't identify once in a while with those longings? You want the world to just stop for a minute so you can be in your happy place. This is a continual pressure cooker, if you will, for one of those new Instapots. And we all need to find that place, maybe a, an old stream side where we can go, or a little boat that's there, or some, some forgotten towns where we can just stroll down the street unnoticed and, and have a time to drink it all in and not have the worries of the day. But in the modern madness of today, I often hear cries for this thing called peace of mind, whatever that looks like. That peace of mind is not always tied to worldly goals like money and fame and success or power. Sometimes it's just the time to be alone. So what are we left with? If money, success, and power won't satisfy, what will? Satisfaction that we seek, the peace of mind that we crave, the sense of fulfillment that we so desperately want is quite simply not found here. It's not in this world. And so we have to conclude that if it's not in this world, if this world does not satisfy our hunger within, then the answer must come from outside the world. And it comes from God and nowhere else. And that's what Augustine was trying to say 1,500 years ago when he wrote this famous prayer. You have made us for yourself, God. And our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And so we have known all along that the only true rest will be in God, the true peace that only He can grant. But we still run around the world looking for that day where it all comes together. We have a restlessness with the things of the world, and I think that's what happens is we're constantly wrestling with all of the things that are going on. And we don't understand why it should be this way. Why can't we have peace on earth? But we're told that there is no such thing. And so as we return to chapter 5 of Romans, Paul's letter takes a decisive turn. Up to this point in the letter, Paul's focus has been on the power of the gospel to put people who are locked up in sin and under sentence of God's wrath into a right relationship with God. Here we see that Paul's entire description of the gospel may be summed up in one word and that's justification. The word means to be declared righteous. Think of the courtroom and the, and the picture, that, picture that moment when a verdict of not guilty is discharged by the judge. Robert Mounts offers this excellent summary of justification. He says to be justified means to be acquitted, to gain a right standing. Justification frees the guilty man from paying the penalty 
of his sin. It declares that he's totally exonerated and all charges are dropped. Therefore, justification is the act whereby God declares a sinner righteous, not guilty, the moment he or she expresses their faith and repentance by being baptized into Jesus. In other words, justification means to be lined up with the things of God. Of course, this acquittal is absolutely free because it's based on the unmerited favor or grace of God. In Jesus, God arranged a plan by which he could justify the guilty and still remain the supreme moral being, and then he carried it out for us. And that's what we consider during this season of Lent as we approach the cross where all of this atonement took place, where this justification happened. Um, we need to look at ourselves and say, why am I not enjoying the idea that I have been saved through Christ? Have I forgotten it? And why have I forgotten it? Well, Look what's happening now with the Center for Disease Control and the Novavirus and, and all of those things that are going on. Um, they tend to steal our peace. They tend to sap our strength and to steal our glory and, our, and our, the thought that we can be at peace while we're still in this world. Seems like in the news every day there's a new development in this thing. And so what we decide today could not be true for tomorrow. But Paul reminds us what happens after we're justified. What's supposed to happen if you are justified, if you are in line with God through Christ. What does it look like for you? How now shall we live? So Paul says, therefore, and you know in the Bible, when it says therefore, you better go see what it's there for. And he's saying that because of everything that he said before about the justification and the right relationship with God, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We've also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. Then in verse 5, this hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And so justification by faith is supposed to be the universal experience of everyone who puts their faith in Christ. So that means that while the things of the world are flying around our heads and causing all sorts of chaos and, and change in our life that we don't agree with, Paul says inside we have this inner peace because of our relationship with Christ and because of his actions that have lined us up with his way and his will. And then Paul starts talking about three great blessings that come to us as a result of all of that. The first great blessing from our justification is that we are supposed to have this inner peace that we talk about. We think that we don't have it in times of worldly turmoil. And we say, why hath thou forsaken us? But he hasn't. Never will, never has, never will. He's there. We are the ones who have pulled away from him because of the concerns of the day. Peace is a positive change in relationship between two people who were once enemies. And so we need to remember that that hasn't changed. We're still supposed to have peace. It's just that the fog of the day and the fog of the world has obscured our vision of it because we've allowed it 
to happen. Well, that doesn't mean that we should ignore what the government's saying and the medical uh, experts and so forth. And, oh, they know what they're talking about. Understand that God puts people in your in your path at a certain time for a certain reason. And I do believe that they are called of Him to to find a resolution to this disease and so forth. So we're not going to ignore what their good advice is. But if we have this inner peace, we know that we don't have to be in church or in Sunday school or crowded together or separate in order to know and love the peace of God. This is a situation that should actually make us stronger. Oh, it may not make us happier. I don't know about you, but when somebody messes with my routine, I'm not a happy camper. And I'm sure that you're probably like that. Right now, this disease is messing with every routine you could even think of. And if you want to talk about routines, go get some toilet paper. Good luck with that. Go buy some water. Go buy some antiseptic cleaning supplies. Go buy a whole lot of things that you would just normally walk into the store and get. Now we in America, we're in a situation where we haven't been disrupted all that much yet. Think of Italy, where there's a total lockdown of the entire country. Churches, stores, everything, whatever your normal routine is, has been stopped. Now those people have to be saying, hey, I don't feel good about this. I'm not feeling very peaceful about this. But I don't know if you saw it on television, but um, what a lot of people in, in Italy are doing is they're coming out on their balconies and they're singing together. They're singing all sorts of songs, including praises of God. Imagine going through that kind of turmoil and saying something Praise God from whom all blessings flow. We've sung it here many times. Do you think that's changed? Answer, no. Because nothing is going to happen in this world that's going to disrupt the justification, the relationship that we have with God. And that's the second great blessing from our justification. We have access to God and God's grace. Yesterday, I was sitting there trying to, uh, online, I was trying to communicate with, with members and friends all over the world. And, and for whatever reason, uh, the Wi-Fi was just crazy slow yesterday. And that's because everybody was trying to communicate at the same time. And I got a little upset because... I was trying to send somebody some really important stuff and I pushed the button and the computer didn't do anything. And so my access was limited. But we can't put that term over into God's world because there is no such thing. Our access is never limited. Enter the presence of the king. That's what the word access is technically means. Consider how revolutionary this truth was to the early believers. The Gentiles were restricted. Think about the temple. They were restricted to the outer court of that temple. It was called the court, excuse me, the court of the Gentiles. If a Gentile went beyond that court, he could be put to death. Next was the court of the women, Jewish female worship. Next was the court of Israel for Jewish men. Next would be the court of the priests where the altar of the sacrifice was. Finally, inside the temple proper, there was the holy place where only the priests could minister. And behind it was the holy of holies that you've heard about. That was separated by the thick curtain. And if you remember on the day that, that, that Jesus uh, was crucified, that curtain was torn apart. It was rent asunder. That's the word for it. To no longer ever exist because our access to the inner holy of holies, which used to be restricted to only the high priest, 
was now open to us. And it wasn't a temporary thing. We're the ones that make it temporary. We're the ones that, um, that, that think that, that God is not listening. But the message of the day is, is that it's always open. John 14, verse 6 says, No one comes to the Father except through me. Also notice that the, Paul says the access is based on the grace in which we stand. And so that grace doesn't change. Our standing before God is based entirely upon His grace, which does not change. How many times have you said this phrase, there but by the grace of God go I? We claim to rely upon this grace of God. But in times of worldly trials, we tend to look and say, where are you, God? And why aren't you fixing this? Where's my peace? I miss it. But folks, we only miss it because we perceive that it is gone. But it's there. The third great blessing from our justification is that we have the hope of glory. This hope Peter talks about. He says we should all be ready to give the reason for the hope that we have. And that hope comes from God. And the word hope can be misleading because we have hope. We have, we're humans. We have hope for everything. I hope this disease goes away tomorrow. I hope that everything gets back to normal. And I hope this and I hope that. I hope the Eagles win the Super Bowl. But is that going to happen? Well, maybe not. But the biblical concept of hope is different. It means a confident, here's the definition, confident expectation that something will happen because God has said it will happen. Be in the Word. One of the greatest things that we can do during this time where we, we've got to stay at home and stay away from public places and the Lord knows we don't want to go to the grocery store unless we really have to. Um, one of the greatest times, one of the greatest things we can do during times like this is to be in the Word. We all have it. Get it out. Daily devotionals. Um, stay tuned for more things like that through this network. Uh, because we want to make sure that people take this as an opportunity. Not as a downtime, as a wasted time period, but as an incredible opportunity to come together knowing that households all over the world are maybe for the first time in a long time focusing on the Word. And remember what Paul also says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're meant to be closer and closer to God as we go. And I think that we need to take this not as a downtime, not as an inconvenience, but as an opportunity for us to understand the grace of God and the true peace of God that can be in our lives. If you want peace like a river, then turn to Jesus. If you want joy like a fountain, turn to Jesus. If you want love like an ocean, turn to Jesus. Now between the river and the fountain and the ocean, I'm guessing one of those is your happy place. And so fine, go there in your heart. Jesus will take you there and enjoy this peace with God access to God through His grace and the hope of God that should never fade. Amen? Let us pray. Oh, Father, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity for us to reach out to one another in this bond of love and the bond of your word. Father, have us know and understand that it takes patience to get through these trying times and you are there with us. It doesn't matter whether we're here or whether we're home, Father. 
uh, you're always with us. Help us to remember that. And help us to pray as you have taught us to. We say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.